Good morning. Good to be back. So, uh, mentioned in our adult. Wow, that's truly loud. Our adult Bible class this morning. Uh, I think it's the first time that we've been away for two weeks back to back since we started being here regularly, and so I truly mean it. Uh, that I really missed you guys and and missed being here. As great as it was to to be with friends and family back home, I've got friends and family here too, and I truly missed being away from you. And to to start our lesson here, I want to start out by saying that uh, I'm going to confess a time when I messed up about a week ago. And so now that i got your ears perked, I'm going to come back to my confession in a moment, but I want to share some, some good news. I uh, had the, the pleasure of baptizing one of my childhood best friends when we were, when we were in West Virginia. And it was a great day. Uh, he shot me a message, just a text message, uh, and said, Hey, Tyler, you uh, got time for a baptism today? And, and so my parents, they have a pool. And so I got a hold of Dad real quick. I said, Dad, how's the water? And he said, oh, it's a little chilly, but it's all right. I said, how's the chlorine content? And he said, well, I mean, it's, it's low, but it keeps the pool clean. I said, is it good enough to take care of some sins? <laughs> and he said, sure is. So my, my friend Daniel, uh, he came up. He's been studying on his own. We've had a lot of conversations just over about the past year or so. Uh, not any deep one-on-one studies, but we've, we've done some light studies and had some conversations. But he's been doing a lot of personal study on his own. And came the decision that uh, he needed to be baptized for the remission of his sins. And so last year we went to West Virginia and my grandma wanted to be baptized. And this year my best friend did. So I'm starting to think we should go back to West Virginia more often. <laughs> uh, they get to keep this trend going. But uh, anyway, now, now for some confession time. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I have weaknesses. Just as all of us do. And last week, uh, let's see, so today's Sunday, eight days ago, so the previous Saturday, I had the, the privilege and the blessing of officiating my cousin's wedding. And she was a very beautiful bride, and it was a very beautiful day. Where I messed up, though, all week it had been calling for rain that Saturday. Now, this is a problem because it's an outdoor wedding. And they don't have a plan B. And so all week, I'm racking my brain. How can we still do this if it's raining? They have a reception hall. It is not set up for a ceremony whatsoever. So all week, I was racking my brain. How can we kind of move tables this way, get some chairs adjusted over here a little bit? How can we just you know, squeeze it in just right? So I've been playing Tetris in my head all week. And uh, so then Saturday comes, forecast, still calling for rain. And the whole time, and this is, this is where I messed up, I was thinking, I'm not going to bother praying for sunshine because I know what the weatherman says. How weak was my faith? I was so busy thinking, well, it's going to rain, so instead of troubling God with my prayer for sunshine for just 30 minutes on Saturday, I'm going to spend my time trying to figure out how to rearrange our reception hall so that they can still have a nice ceremony, even, even if it isn't perfect. Well, then, as he often does, God proved me wrong. So the wedding's at 4 and it had been kind of sprinkling rain on and off all day. It started out sunny, and then the clouds would roll in to be a little shower. And then, and then about 2 o'clock, I mean, there's not a cloud in the sky. It's nice and sunny. It's like, hey, look at that. It's a beautiful day. Uh, God is, is looking out for us. Didn't even say a prayer, and we still got it answered, right? And then 3.30 comes. The wedding starts at 4. 3.30 comes, and then the storm clouds come back. It's like, oh, I spoke too soon. <laughs> Here comes the rain. And it rained, a solid steady rain for 20 minutes. 10 minutes till time for the wedding to start. And then the clouds moved on. And the sun came back out. And we had some gentlemen out there with leaf blowers and towels getting all the benches dried off for the ceremony. Thank you, Lord. 
gave us a break in the rain for this ceremony. So I was reflecting on that. And I was thinking, how many times have we not prayed because we're afraid the answer is no? Because we think we already know what's going to happen, so we're not going to trust God with what we want to happen. I was thinking on that, and then I was also thinking on our series in James, because we are doing a series on James. I was thinking from our last three lessons, how prominently James speaks about prayer and trusting God in trials in our life. And so I thought for today, instead of moving on to our next section on James, we would just spend today uh, thinking about prayer, specifically the struggles of unanswered prayers, or really uh, praying when we're afraid that the answer will be no. I'm not going to bother God by praying for those clouds to move, because I know the weatherman's always right. How weak was my faith? And God, he proved me wrong. So how do we respond when God seemingly doesn't answer our prayers, or perhaps even answers no? Because, let's face it, rejection hurts, doesn't it? Think about children. Think about if your memory is good enough, mine is starting to not be so great anymore. But you think back to when you were a child, or if you're still young enough to be in that boat, think about how many times you don't ask mom and dad for something because you know that if you ask and they say no, that's the end of the story. All hope is now gone. It's better to not ask the question and still have that little bit of hope that if I don't ask, then it's always a maybe. But if I ask and they say no, it's done. No hope left. Or what about if you're married? Have you ever been afraid to ask your spouse for something? Because hearing your spouse say no is more painful than just suffering in silence. Rejection hurts. And then when we turn to God in prayer, do we guard our prayers in such a way that we try to not be disappointed in God? It's like, well, if I don't pray for you know, X, Y, Z things, and then I don't get them, well, then I can't really blame God because I never really asked for it anyway. We think we're protecting God from our disappointment in Him when we don't trust Him with our prayers. And if you remember what James has taught us so far in our lessons on prayer, we see that when we are facing times of trial, verses 2 through 4, those trials are meant to build us up, to edify us, to strengthen us, to increase our faith. And God helps us through those trials, verses 5 through 8, with two gifts. One is the avenue of prayer. To come to God. To ask for wisdom. And that wisdom is the second gift that God gives us. He might not always give us the answer for every why that we have. But he has promised to give wisdom to those who diligently seek it. We might not always get all of our answers. But we will get the wisdom that we need in order to continue serving him. And then in verse 17, James tells us that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. You see, we don't have to be afraid to pray because we can trust that God, unlike our fickle emotions and desires that are always changing, God is unchanging, He's eternally loving, and He always knows what is best for us. He always gives us the good gifts. And yes, he will even allow us to be challenged from time to time for the sake of our growth. And now, it all sounds good in theory, but I know that there's been times in each one of our lives when we have questioned God. We've prayed earnestly, and we haven't gotten what we prayed for. I know of, of people personally that they left the faith, they gave up on God because a loved one passed away, 
a loved one who there had been many, many earnest prayers for healing, but healing wasn't the answer that God gave. And because of that, they, they left the faith. And these are definitely hard and trying situations. And there's not always going to be an easy answer. But what I'd like to propose here for the next few minutes is for us to consider some reasons that God might say no. And then we will wrap up this lesson uh, with some thoughts on things that we can do even when the answer is no. Okay, So let's jump in. Six good reasons that God might answer with a no. And see, number one... I'm just I'm hitting the controversial one right up front. Let's just get it out of the way. Number one is that it could be because of sin in your life. Now, this isn't an absolute rule because we're all sinners. If this were the case in an absolute sense, he wouldn't hear a single one of our prayers. But yet it remains true that John, chapter 15, verse 7, John teaches us that from the words of Jesus, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. It, it seems that God is more attuned to answer the prayers of those who are abiding in his word. And then even James, and we'll, we'll get to this a few weeks, if maybe not months from now. Uh, in James chapter 5, James tells us that the prayer of a righteous person has great power. We see that even in Scripture, those that are living faithfully and obediently, their prayers seem to carry just a little bit more weight. But even God's non-chosen people, even those who aren't necessarily living faithfully, we still see plenty of examples when their prayers are heard. We have the, the wicked people of Nineveh in the time of Jonah. They pray for rescue, and God answered their prayer. We see that Hagar the concubine of Abraham, who was the mother of Ishmael, the not-promised son. She prays for safety, and God still comes to their rescue. We see that the wicked king Ahab, he prays for protection from God's destruction as punishment for his sins very directly, and God even heard his prayer. And even throughout the New Testament, there are numerous examples of Gentile persons of non-Jews that come to Jesus asking for help. Mark chapter 7, 24 through 30 is one example in which we have a Gentile woman, somebody who, who doesn't believe in, in Yahweh, God. Somebody who doesn't necessarily at the moment believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but she recognizes there's something different about Jesus. She recognizes the level of authority that he has. And when she prays and asks for Jesus to heal her daughter, he answers that. And so I just give these examples out there to show that God does hear the prayers of, of sinners. But as a general observation throughout Scripture, what God truly hears is the prayers of all people who are genuinely seeking Him. Whether they're already saved or not, those that are genuinely seeking Him, those that are genuinely seeking truth, those are the prayers that are answered. And so when we pray, we need to consider, are we praying because we are genuinely seeking God's will? Are we genuinely seeking to bring glory to Him? Are we seeking ways to serve Him? Or are we just praying out of temporal and selfish desires? Treating God like Burger King, where we can just have it our way. See, God does allow us to suffer the physical consequences of our sins. And if we are not living a lifestyle that's focused on God, then God will allow us to experience what a life without God truly looks like. I want to share with you a couple real-life cases that I've either dealt with directly one-on-one -on -one or uh, I have some Christian brethren that have told me some of their stories as well of people who are in this boat where they are praying diligently for God to rescue them and to help them and yet have no real desire to make changes for God. Why doesn't God help me? But I still go to the bar and get drunk with friends and complain about 
how my life is in shambles because of the poor decisions that I made while in drunken stupors. Why doesn't God save me from that? Why doesn't God help me while I'm still responding with anger and threats and even violently hurting other people every time someone crosses me or offends me in even the slightest? Well, I just don't understand why God isn't intervening in my life. Why doesn't God help me but then enters into a relationship with a person who convinces them that drugs are okay? God, I don't, I don't understand why you're not saving me. Uh, aren't you more powerful than my significant other who's got me hooked on drugs and now I'm living homelessly because I choose drugs? Why aren't you saving me? Why doesn't God help me while I go associate with friends who convince me that Norse North North mythology is true and that I should pray to Odin also? God, why don't you hear my prayers? I guess if you're going to turn a deaf ear, maybe I'll see if Odin's listening. It's very much a fact that the majority of all trials allowed by God in this life come in the form of our own mistakes. The sins of ourselves or the sins of others are responsible for the majority of the pain and suffering that we feel. And we need to have the wisdom to identify the areas of our life where we're not including God. Where we've cut him out for some reason. And we need to make him the primary focus in that part of our life. If you pray for God's help while continuing to live in sin, then your problem is not with God's silence, but with your own disobedience. As a simple analogy, we wouldn't be justified to complain about how poor our physical health is while we go out and eat a dozen donuts every day of the week. The problem is with, with your decisions, not with your, your health. Your health could be fine if you made the right decisions, but in like manner, we can't complain about our poor spiritual health when we relegate God to a couple minutes a day or maybe an hour of worship on Sunday. God is either primary in your life or he's not. And that's a decision that you need to make. But there are times when it is our sins that are to blame for the circumstances that we're in. Now, number two, why did God answer no? Well, it could be not because he's punishing us for sin, but because he's preparing us. He is strengthening our faith. He's producing steadfastness in us. We've already read from James, but Paul echoes this, sim this similar sentiment in Romans 5, verses 2 through 4. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God, not only that we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Uh, yes, there are trials in this life are meant to purify us. There are times that God loves us so much that he's willing to break our hearts. To break us of our pride. To strip us of our selfish and greedful ambitions. To light a match under our slothful and lazy feet. There are times God answers no as a wake-up call to toughen you up and to get you moving. I remember going through basic training about seven years ago now. Actually, yeah, we're in the month of August, exactly seven years ago now. I'm in the South Carolina heat. It's the hottest environment I've ever been in. We had 100, the highs were 110, and the lows were like 95, and the humidity was 100% all the time. Absolutely miserable. And the wake-up calls that we got always came in the form of midnight, 2 in the morning, 4 in the morning, with drill sergeants coming in and throwing trash cans and toppling over wall lockers, cause all this ruckus while I'm trying to sleep, and they drag us out of beds and they start making us do jumping jacks and push-ups all hours of the night. <laughs> and I was not too happy about it. I don't know anyone else was either. But they did it for a reason. They were training us how to respond in times of high stress. 
Because if you're out on a battlefield fighting an enemy, that enemy is not going to take a time out so that you can get a nice, nice good eight hour rest at nighttime. They're preparing us for war and for battle. And truthfully, they're preparing us for a PT test too, because a lot of us couldn't pass the push outs. And so, Army regulation during physical training time, they're only allowed to give us a certain number of reps of push ups. They were only allowed to do like sets of 10. They couldn't do any more. So, how do they get around that? You're not going to be able to pass your PT test of doing 40 push ups when they're only allowed to train us with 10. So, what do they do? Well, they wake us up at 3 in the morning because that's not PT time and they smoke us for an hour. That's allowed. They were preparing us for the test. In like manner, there are times when God will answer no in order to strengthen us and prepare us for a, a future test down the road. And so in such situations, our focus needs not be on, God, why did you answer no? But rather, God, how can I still serve you even when the answer is no? How can I still bring glory to you even though I didn't get what I wanted? Now, number three is... God might be answering no because he's protecting you from something worse. And this is where a little faith goes a long way. I've used this illustration countless times. I call it my red light theology. And that's you're, you're rushing, you're running late to work, and you're, trying, you're driving like a madman through town, and, and then you get stopped by every single red light. And what you're, you're cursing that red light. God, I just need the green light. I need to get to work. Well, what you don't know is perhaps that red light is what saved you from dying in a T-bone car accident. You see, we don't know all of the ways that God is constantly, continually protecting us from even worse harm than what we're going through. To share a true story, uh, my dad and then his first cousin, Randall, when they were uh, about college age, I don't remember exactly how old they were, this was long before I was even born, but they, when they were about high school, college age, uh, Dad tells a story. They were going on a camping trip with a family friend of theirs. And they were really excited uh, to go out kind of like a guy's weekend, you know. Uh, going out to a cabin. They're going to do some fishing, some hiking. They're really looking forward to it. Uh, but then the night before they were supposed to leave, uh, both Dad and, and, my, and his cousin Randall, they just unexplainably got really, really sick, like to their stomachs. Uh, like, like their question like it was like food poisoning or something. And they're like, man, we, we want to go on this camping trip, but I can barely get out of bed right now. I can barely get out of the bathroom. So we're going to have to cancel. Well, then, so they didn't go. And the next, the next night, the following night, um, their, their friend that they were going with, uh, he died in his sleep at that cabin. There was a gas leak. Now, it's unfortunate for their friend, but... I can't help but wonder, this unexplained, sudden onset of a stomach sickness that they suffered that night, that prevented them from going, was that God protecting them? See, we just don't know. Another true story, uh, one of my college friends, her dad, worked at the Pentagon during 9-11. Not only at the Pentagon, he worked in the wing that got hit by the plane. And I don't remember all the details now. It's, it's a little foggy. It's too far removed from it. But um, I remember hearing the story from him firsthand of all of the unusual circumstances that had him not going into work that day. He was supposed to be at work, but there was like some weird meeting. I don't remember what the story was now. He was supposed to be there. But for whatever reason, he wasn't in the office that day. Can't help but wonder if God was protecting him. So sometimes in our life, when we're going through hardships and we're going through trials that are steering us a different direction than the way we want to be going, we need to have a little bit of trust that perhaps God is actually protecting us from something much worse. But on the other side, sometimes He is preparing us for something greater. You know, a great example of this is Mary and Martha and their, their brother, Lazarus. He's dying. He's sick. He's on his deathbed. Literally, he dies. What they thought of was Jesus heal him. But Jesus had a greater plan in mind. They wanted healing. Jesus wanted resurrection. 
he was going to teach a much greater and more profound lesson through the resurrection of Lazarus than a healing would. You know, sometimes God's no is not rejection, but a redirection. Now, uh, one of the most embarrassing professional events in my life was when I interviewed for position with the U.S. Marshals. This was back in 2011, 2012. And I say it was one of the most embarrassing because it was my first, like, real interview for a job. I mean, I'd worked some other jobs, but none of them really. I mean, I was like working as a gym attendant, like wiping down equipment. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't a professional, serious interview. And so I'm sitting here with a, a panel of three U.S. Marshals, and they're, they're interviewing me to be hired by them as, a, as an intern, which would then become a, a deputy. And, and I choked. I froze. I remember they asked me uh, the question, can you give us an example of a, of a selfless act that you did? And in that moment of, like, I'm just so intimidated by them, the, the only thing I could think of and, and, and fumble to get out of my mouth was, well, I helped my mom unload the dishes from the dishwasher. I'm seeing some laughter. I'm glad you all appreciate how trivial that sounds when I'm interviewing for a job as a federal law enforcement officer who has to track down, you know, fugitives and criminals, right? I absolutely tanked that interview. It was so embarrassing. But that interview taught me some very valuable lessons. It, it wanted, it taught me how to prepare for an interview. I knew nothing about the interview process. I was going in totally blind. I did not prepare for it at all. So it taught me how to prepare for interviews, how to think more professionally, and to have some things prepared ahead of time. Uh, but in failing that interview, that's also when I took on uh, a second major and, and got a degree in national security and intelligence. Yeah, I was Previous, I was law enforcement only, but after that, uh, I went a direction of pursuing uh, national security and intelligence, which led me to my position in the National Guard, which led me to my Germany deployment, which led me to meeting Megan, which led me to, to Edwin, and it led me to you guys. And, and so you can, you can just see the dominoes, right? You can, and I'm sure every one of us here that's over the age of about 18 can probably think of places and times in your life when something went terribly wrong according to what you wanted and you didn't get your way, but it led to something far greater. It might have taken you weeks to realize it. It might have taken you years to realize it. But I bet most of us here can come up with at least one, if not many, examples when God told us no, but he had something gr much greater for us in store. Sometimes a little patience goes a long ways. Number five, why God might say no. Sometimes we pray for things that are conflicting goods. You know, don't you all know that the winning football team is determined by who has the most fans that are praying? And then you take that variable and you multiply it by the number of football players that has Philippians 4.13 tattooed on their shoulders. Right? Whoever has that, the highest ratio there, that's going to be the winning football team. Right? The, the point is, there might be conflicting prayers. You know, My cousin's wedding. Praying for clear skies. Well, my failure to not pray. Meanwhile, there might be a farmer who's praying diligently for more rain because he knows the crops need it. And you talk to anybody who knows farming out here, they're always praying for rain. Meanwhile, when we have a family vacation schedule, we're like, God, can, can it just rain when we get back from vacation? Those farmers can wait another week, you know. Sometimes we have conflicting values and conflicting desires. So sometimes we need to think that maybe God answered no to us because he's answering yes to someone else. And we need to be willing to kind of sacrifice our immediate desires and recognize there's more to this life than just me and just my wants. And then lastly, sometimes our misfortune can be for the benefit of others. Yet we can look at Lazarus once again. His resurrection was for the benefit of the crowd of witnesses. They got this witness, the power of God, the power of Jesus, but even more so, 
Jesus' own death is the perfect example that sometimes our misfortune, sometimes the bad things that happen in our life are for the benefit of others. I heard a story one time. I, as far as I know, it's true. I, I, I wasn't able to like look and fact check it, but I heard a story one time of a, a church that was supporting a mission that was in China. And one of the guys that was helping put together, they were putting together um, like gift boxes, boxes and care packages uh, for the mission team, and then for uh, they were working, they were working with like school aged children. So in China, you can't do open ministry. You you'll get thrown in prison or killed, or thrown in prison and then killed. And so they have to go. That fly under the radar. So usually the way that missionaries get over there is they go as English teachers, and, and so they they go to teach young children English. Uh, by day and by night, they're crime fighters for Jesus. They're fighting, you know, Satan over there, and they're preaching the gospel at night in the underground church. And so, anyway, so they're sending. Uh, a gentleman was helping with the boxes, uh, putting together like clothing drive and care packages and whatnot. And his glasses uh, fall out of the shirt pocket into one of the boxes, and he doesn't know this until later. And so they, they package them all. They send them overseas. They send them over to China. Uh, he gets home and he can't find his glasses anywhere. And if he could only find his glasses, then he'd be able to see to look for them, right? And so he was really upset by this because uh, he wasn't in a place where he could, he had just bought those glasses the day before, and his insurance wouldn't cover another pair, and he could scarcely afford uh, another pair. So he was, he was really upset by this. And so then months later, when uh, the, the primary uh, mission leader came back on furlough from, from that work and was speaking to the church, uh, he he said, I want to thank you guys for sending those glasses in that care package. Uh, he said, a week before we got your package, the Chinese police came in and, and raided our school and, and, and my glasses got broke. And so I had to go a week not being able to see hardly anything. And I started suffering severe headaches and I wasn't able to get another pair. And, and then very timely, God answered my prayer and lo and behold, not only is there a pair of glasses in this care package, it just so happened to be my exact prescription. It was exactly what I needed. Sometimes our misfortune can benefit others. Now this one I know 100% is true. Uh, are, how many of you all are familiar with the Gospel Broadcasting Network, GBN? So one of their directors, Don Blackwell, about four years ago, was in a terrible ATV accident, paralyzed from the waist down after that. Excruciating pain. Was in the hospital for months, trying to go through physical therapy and recovery. He gets out of the hospital. He has to, have, he has to hire a construction team to come in and redo his whole house to make it wheelchair accessible. Have widened doorways, install wheelchair ramps, all the like. He's got a captive audience. He's got a whole team of construction workers, so what does he do? He starts asking them about their faith. He starts preaching the gospel. And if I remember the story right, three of them wanted to be baptized after that. Joined a local congregation. See, sometimes what Satan meant for evil, God can use for good. So long as we are willing to allow God to use us for good. I can't even imagine the joy that Mr. Blackwell must have felt. God, why did you let me endure this terrible accident? Why am I paralyzed from the waist down? Well, maybe it's because those construction workers needed to hear the gospel. And then they obeyed. God can use us in our every life circumstance if we are willing to let him use us. We need to remember that the most earnest prayer ever uttered came from Jesus in the garden. Lord, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours. Their will, not sometimes, not maybe, not occasionally, there will be trials in your life. There will be some pains and sufferings that seemingly go unanswered. And in such times... We need to take up our cross and follow Jesus. God, if this is a cross that I must bear, help me to carry it in such a way that I bring honor to you. So I want to close this lesson by 
considering a few things that we can do when God does answer no. I think of the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from Daniel chapter 3. I think many of us are probably familiar with the passage. There are Israelites living as slaves in Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylon uh, king, emperor, he issued a decree that anybody who doesn't bow down and worship the pagan gods and worship a golden idol will be thrown in a fiery furnace. They will be executed. They will be killed for not worshiping a false god. Well, these three Israelites, they refuse to bow down. And they say, our God is able to deliver us from this fiery furnace and out of your hands, O king, but if not, we will not serve your gods. What a powerful testament to their faith. God will save us from you, but if not, even if the answer to our prayer is no, we will never bow down and serve another God. There is only one God that we serve. And it is through their firmness of faith, and God does rescue them, that after that, Nebuchadnezzar issues a new proclamation that the Israelite people are free to serve their God. There will be no more persecution for their faith. Because of their firmness, the entire nation had their sufferings alleviated. Because the king said, okay, I'm going to let the Jews go on this one because I've seen the power of their God. Now when you have a fearless faith such as this, the fires which Satan meant to destroy you are rendered nothing more than a warm reminder of God's protection in your life. So how can you respond to hearing no from God? Number one, focus on a specific goal. Because it's too easy when we, when we get rejected, right? When we hear no, we immediately want to complain. That's just like our instant reaction. We lose sight on what's really important. So I would challenge that we need to focus on a specific goal and we need to ask the right questions to help us with this. What is my goal in this prayer? What am I truly asking God for? What is it that I really want? How will it help me serve God? How will I serve God even if the answer is no? And now with these goals, I would challenge you not to be vague. So I'll give three specific examples. A vague goal would be like, well, I want to be a better evangelist. What does that really mean? Let's be more specific. I want to have five conversations about my faith per week. That's a specific goal. That's something you can work towards. What about, I want to be a better spouse. Well, that's pretty vague. Let's be more specific. Let's really focus on what do I want out of being a better spouse. How about, I want to do five charitable deeds for my spouse per day. That's a specific goal that you can work towards. That's a specific goal that you can pray for God's help with. I want to be a better Bible reader. Well, again, that's a pretty vague goal. What, is that, what does that really mean? How about you set a specific goal? I want to read 15 additional minutes per day in God's Word. Second, establish a plan of action. So you're focusing on a goal. Now you need to focus on a plan of action. Don't wish without working, and don't pray without performing. Sometimes the answer to moving a mountain is being handed a shovel, and you need to start digging. How can you work toward accomplishing that goal? You need to assess the tools that God has already put in your life so that you can get to work. So for evangelizing, think about the number of situations you have every day in which you could talk about faith more. Then decide to start ceasing some of those opportunities. For example, the next time you're waiting in line at a coffee shop, form a concrete plan on when you're going to take action. What about being a better spouse? Consider all the things that you know that your spouse likes. And then look for opportunities to do them. Now, maybe your spouse uh, is attentive to words of affirmation. That's their love language. Make it a goal to do five compliments per day. Now, what about Bible, uh, better Bible reading? Take some time to think about how much time has God really given me in a day? Out of the 24 hours we have for today, how am I using it? Where can we make sacrifices? Is it waking up 15 minutes earlier? Is it doing 
15 less minutes of screen time maybe. Find a specific plan to begin working towards what you're praying for. And then focus on the self-discipline. You've got the goal, you've got the plan, but now it's going to take discipline. Practice makes perfect, and the mountain isn't going to move with one scoop of the shovel. You wouldn't expect to lose 20 pounds overnight because you ate one salad. I mean, I do, but it never works out. I'm always disappointed every morning when I jump on the scale and I'm like, well, that salad didn't do anything for me. But our prayer life is much the same way. Change takes time. Change takes time. Trust God through the process and seek out His will as you're sticking to it. And then lastly, focus on prayer. Focus on gratitude. As Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. You know, it's kind of funny. Last night while I was thinking about my lesson over and thinking about prayer and thinking about gratitude, uh, I was cleaning up after supper, and I'm, I'm very hurriedly moving the dishes from the, from the table to, to the sink. And we had a, a steak knife on one of the plates, and I go and I, I move it very quickly over, and I hear it sliding off the plate. And, and it stops at like its perfect balance point, or like just, I mean, the smallest fraction more, and it's going to fall. And where was it going to fall? The point was going to land right on my foot as I'm standing by the sink, but it stopped right on the edge, and it didn't fall. It's those little moments like that that we need to stop and say, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I don't have to go to the hospital now. <laughs> thank you for that knife stopping and not falling on my foot. It's those little reminders, those little things that we need to focus on and be thankful for. Positivity is, is just as contagious as negativity. And when we fill our minds with all of the things that go right, the things that go wrong won't seem quite as painful. So in closing, we'll, we'll go back to James. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. Now the greatest gift was His Son, a sacrifice for our sins, the narrow gate, the only door to salvation. The prayer that God has already answered yes to is God save me from my sins. Jesus has already came. He's already died on the cross for you and for me. And the gift of that death on the cross is met with forgiveness of our sins when we join in that death through the waters of baptism. If there's anyone here this morning that has yet to do so and would like to have their sins forgiven, that is a prayer that God's already answered yes to. You just have to be willing to submit and obey to His Word. If there's anyone here who just needs simply some prayers, some extra support or encouragement, feel free to let us know. Use this church family. You can let us know publicly here as, as we're singing. Let us know afterwards. But reach out so that we can help you with whatever you're going through. Whatever your needs are, please let us know as together we stand and sing.